Hi, I'm Jag Singh from Medscape Cardiology. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with two really esteemed panelists. Uh, we have with us George Sturgio, who's a professor of medicine and hypertension from the University of Athens in Greece. And we have Rama Mukamala from the University of Pittsburgh, who's a senior engineer out there. Uh, it's going to be a phenomenal discussion on the arena of uh, cupless blood pressure monitoring um, and where it's going in the future and how we need to kind of keep on top of it. Let me start with you, George. You know, uh, hypertension is a big issue. Uh, monitoring is a big issue. Why are people having so many problems with cup-based strategies that we're now thinking about cupless strategies? Um, first, uh, I have to say that cuff-based uh, measurement has been the basis for the whole chapter of, of clinical hypertension. This is how I managed to identify the condition, to diagnose, to manage, to follow. So this has been a great success and for, for, for treating efficiently uh, people with high blood pressure and preventing disease. So it has been a success story. On the other hand, um, cuff measurement uh, causes several issues when it is used in the office, when it is used by people at home, and also for ambulatory monitoring. So um, first, it takes very little information of the blood pressure behavior. Blood pressure is a continuous phenomenon for 24 hours, beat to beat. So by taking two or three measurements in the office, or morning, evening at home, or even every 20 minutes for one 24-hour period every few months, we take too little information on the burden that the vasculature and the heart and the brain sees from high blood pressure. That's, so, that's terrific. Uh, that's an amazing segue. And let me kind of move to Rama out there. Rama, what are the different couplet strategies that uh, are available right now? And how do you kind of differentiate between them? Well, there's a number of cuffless uh, blood pressure measurement methods, um, and uh, several devices now have regulatory clearance in at least one country. Maybe uh, off the top of my head, I can think of seven. And uh, they all, uh, these seven at least, and perhaps all the devices that have regulatory clearance operate uh, based on pulse wave analysis and pulse arrival time. Pulse wave analysis uh, involves measuring an, a peripheral arterial waveform, usually using an optical sensor or a force sensor, and then extracting features from those uh, from the waveform using machine learning, and then calibrating the features to blood pressure values. Pulse arrival time methods. Uh, work in conjunction with pulse wave analysis methods. And pulse arrival time methods also record the electrocardiogram. And uh, they will also extract features uh, from that signal as well as the arterial waveform. And uh, then, you know, those features are likewise calibrated to blood pressure values. And the calibration is aided by periodic cuff blood pressure measurements. So you need to take a cuff blood pressure measurement, say every month, and that's used in the calibration process. That's the most typical way to do the calibration. There are some devices that will now do the calibration just based on the demographic information uh, of the user. No, that's that's terrific. Now, now I understand that there are lots of, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, that there are reproducibility issues with them and that there are several demographic variables that can confound the measurements. And I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts, George. Uh, you know, uh, with all that exists right now, what is the stance of the European Society of Hypertension um, on, on where cupless monitoring stands? Well, um, we as clinicians uh, uh, care about uh, accuracy, but also usefulness. And we see the potential of these technologies for providing to us a complete picture of the blood pressure profile and behavior of an individual. So we expect these devices to be more useful to, to, to establish the risk associated with the blood pressure behavior in an individual. On the other hand, we, we realize that on top of what uh, uh, Rama said, 
about different technologies, which, you know, it's, it's a kind of engineer presentation you had. For me as a clinician, these are tools. And there are different tools, not only different technology, but different tools. It's different if it's a wearable device, a smart uh, uh, watch, or a portable device. It is on your uh, smartphone, or it is a device that needs calibration, so it becomes an individual device. So we believe in the potential of these technologies. In fact, I personally believe that if we get it right, we can change the whole chapter of measurement. We can get rid of all what we have, uh, but we need to prove the accuracy and you need to prove the usefulness on top of what we already have. So we are happy with complexity, but it has to prove its added value. So Rama, can you tell us a little bit about the Aurora project? Yes, uh, we George and I wrote a uh, editorial on the Microsoft Research Aurora project, and let me give you the gist. So Microsoft Research, as we all know, is one of the most prestigious companies in the world, and they put huge resources into investigating cuffless blood pressure measurement, and they basically studied uh, the same tech as regulatory clear devices. And they found that uh, the devices didn't work. And it's not that they didn't work well, it's that they offer zero value. And what they did is they gave their data away from their study. And uh, based on everything in the public domain, they apparently quit cuffless blood pressure measurement. Wow, wow, that's, that's uh, I don't know if, I don't know how to interpret that, but certainly a setback, but you know, and educate, it helps us kind of understand what we need to do for the future. So on that note, uh, George, what needs to change, uh, you know, and how do we kind of use this information to guide the future? First, um, it's not only this project, which is a mega project, but other smaller projects, and it's important because they have, they come from different directions, from independent study, show to the same direction, that we don't have it for the moment. Uh, so uh, we, uh, I, as a clinician, understand that it's more difficult than I thought. I'm not going to invent something like that, Rama and other engineers will do, but we realize that Although it's, it would be superb to have it and investigate how to use it, it doesn't seem that we will going to get it quite soon. So for the moment, we are quite skeptical on how to inform people, our colleagues and our patients and people, because you know what? Everybody is very excited with cuffless technology. Everybody likes to wear something and have your blood pressure and, and they don't care too much for the details. And I also would like to ask that the, the paper by Aurora Microsoft uh, project was too complex for me to understand. So this is why I wrote to, to this editorial to, to try to explain to our colleagues the message behind a mega project on capture measurements, which means we don't have it yet for clinical medicine. Yeah, you, you told me right at the outset, uh, George, that uh, clinicians are from Venus and you're from Venus and Rama is from Mars. He's, a, he's an engineer. Uh, let me kind of pitch the same thing to Rama. Rama, what do you think needs to happen from the engineering side or, or is it the clinician perspective side that is uh, what is you know uh, creating issues out here? How would you approach this? Well, I mean, I think there are two things. Uh, um, the first thing is more on George's expertise, but you know, to have a, a, a standard to validate cuffless devices uh, would be important, um, you know, that maybe the regulatory bodies could adopt it and that's how they could clear devices and it would uh, prevent uh, inadequate devices from being used uh, for clinical purposes. On the technology side, uh, you know, the general approach is, you know, let's make measurements that are easy and then let's throw it in a neural net and see if we can get blood pressure out. And uh, that does that so far that hasn't worked. And it's not that machine learning doesn't work. Machine learning works great. It's just that the measurements that are being made don't have blood pressure information in it. And so what what I think is I you know we need to, I think we need to look at different approaches 
Uh, so a technological breakthroughs uh, on completely different methods. Um, you know, maybe uh, taking inspiration from how automatic cuffs work, maybe targeting the aorta. You know, most uh, most of these devices target small vessels and they're, they have smooth muscle on it and that causes a lot of prop problems and technical problems, but the aorta is more elastic and it's hard to get convenient measurements from it. So I didn't mean to get too technical, but- No, yeah. no, I think that, that's perfectly uh, on, on point. So George, you know, I find the whole concept daunting, right? Our entire literature has been based off cuff-based monitoring and how we practice medicine is based off cuff-based monitoring. Do you think that the advent of cuffless, whenever it comes down the pike, is going to mean that we have to redo all those studies again? Or what are your thoughts on that? Any new technology have to has to take into account the huge amount of clinical data that we have and has to serve this uh, um, science that we have developed, which has been very efficient, but can improve. So um, no question, these devices have to, to, to be able to inform based on the thresholds we have, which are based on millimeters mercury. We can't change that. It's so difficult to replicate all this work and make so different. So it has to continue uh, the clinical science we have developed for decades. So they have to report millimeters of mercury. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Now that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, changing the units is gonna to just totally change our mindset and, and it's going to really impact the way we treat our patients. So that but can become we, a huge challenge. We have uh, done that already by adopting electronic devices. Um, uh, um, uh, Today, we recommend oscillometric devices for office home ambulatory. They are also cuff devices, but they are different. They have nothing to do with mercury and millimeters mercury. They use another principle, but they transform their measurements in millimeters mercury. It's so difficult to change all human <laughs> patients, Absolutely. doctors, primary care to a different kind of measurement. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great point. So before we close off, I'm going to give both of you a, a quick opportunity to any, any wrap up comments. Rama, let me start with you. Any takeaway comments for clinicians and engineers that you'd like to leave us with? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of studies in the literature and uh, many of them are on the same tech, this pulse wave analysis and pulse arrival time. And many of them will report uh, that those methods work well and uh, in, in most instances, they're actually misleading. And so, you know, I would say, don't take these papers for face value. We have to look at them critically and, uh, and then conclude if we think that these devices, the data show they work well or not. Good to know, good to know. Any parting pearls from you, George? Um, uh, Jack, I said in the beginning that you, you, you invited here my friend from Mars. And I'm from Venus. So in, in, in Venus, we don't care how the devices work. We don't care because we cannot understand. We don't have the background. But at the end of the day, we will take the devices and try to see if they work in our patients in the way we use them. And so we have standards how to evaluate them. And we don't care how they work, provided that they do. So for 30 years, the Americans had a different protocol, the Europeans another one, the British their own protocol, the Germans their own protocol. And very few years ago, we decided to have a universal standard, then we were happy and relaxed. What's the problem? The problem is that this universal standard is almost zero information for testing cuffless devices, one problem. So if you see a cuffless devices tested using this super universal standard we love, it's not enough. The second is that, okay, we need another one. We don't need another one. We need several ones because this is one, not one technology. Rama has taught me that the, they work differently. They are different in their background technology, in, in the kind of devices, in the intended use, on whether they are wearable or not. And so we, are, we need to end up with something which fits for every kind of different uh, cuffless devices. And uh, we'll probably need some time to come up 
with something useful. When we have it, it can really make a change to, to us and our patients. I couldn't agree with you more. I think uh, whether you're from Venus or whether you're from Mars, whether you love patients or you love technology, the, the ultimate goal out here is to provide better patient care and make the outcomes much better than where they are today. Uh, I wanna thank you both for taking the time to be here. Uh, this was a fascinating discussion on coupler strategies and I cannot wait to get you back again in the next few months or years to kind of see where this is further advanced uh, because this is certainly an area to watch. Uh, so thank you once again, and thank you to all those who are listening. Uh, this is Jag Singh from Medscape Cardiology. Thank you. <laughs>